I'm Matthew Melmed, Executive Director of Zero to Three. We are a national nonprofit whose mission is to promote the health and development of our nation's babies and toddlers. Every seven minutes, a baby or toddler in America is removed from his parents' care because of alleged abuse or neglect. In 2005, innovative work in Miami-Dade County inspired Zero to Three to create a pilot program combining judicial muscle with child development expertise and community partnerships to give babies and toddlers the life-changing help they need. The Zero to Three Safe Babies Court Teams have been so successful that children served by the court teams have exited the foster care system one year earlier on average than children in a nationally representative comparison group. This film will show you how other courts and communities are using Safe Baby Court Teams to change the futures for their most vulnerable children. I'm Ernestine Gray. I'm a juvenile court judge in New Orleans, Louisiana. It's my understanding that he uh, submitted to a paternity test to correct and it was returned indicating he was not the father. When I first came on the bench in 1984, I, I would say that what I found here and was pretty much the same around the nation was that lots of cases in which children had been in care for years, and I mean five, ten years, and they were supervised by the courts and the agencies, and the children were still lingering. I'm Connie Cohen, and I am the Associate Juvenile Judge in the 5th Judicial District of Iowa in Polk County, Des Moines, Iowa. You've been through this before, and, and we thought things were safe to go away from your lives, and it didn't turn out that way. Before I knew of the damage that could be done to children by neglect and exposure to domestic violence, we were making huge mistakes. We didn't know the trauma of moving children from placement to placement because you're not really moving children from a placement. You're moving a young child who often cannot verbalize to a whole set of new relationships. Early relationships were on the basis of all later relationships and if early relationships are one after another after another with no continuity and no consistency, then a child doesn't learn to trust. Moving around from family to family prevents a child from developing one of the most important core processes that is essential for development, and that is attachment, which can be defined as having an enduring social bond with another. All right, let's see what good sounds are coming from your heart. Brain development proceeds at a much more faster pace in the early months and years of life, and there are important developmental processes that are going through a dynamic change every second, every minute, every day of this child's life. You need to stand up like that. Ah, yes, you did it. This is amazing about kids can do. Did you see her stick her tongue out when yeah. I stuck my tongue out? That's because babies have a lot of brain cells that we call mirror cells, like a mirror, and they are programmed, whatever you will do, she will repeat that. Okay. So I tell parents it better be your smile most of the time. <laughs> she sees that, Liz, see? It's helpful for us to think about brain architecture as a construction that develops over time, that incorporates the influences of genes, but also of experience in the environment. And the brain organizes itself differently depending on which kind of world it is preparing for based on the quality of early experience. But the brain's openness to experience also means that it is vulnerable well, to the kinds of stresses and threats and dangers, especially if these are occurring as a regular part of the child's everyday experience. The kind of brain imaging that compares children who are under chronic stress with those who are not, shows many things. It shows, on one hand, a hyper-connection between brain areas that regulate and that manage stress responses. We also see diminished connectivity. Sometimes we also see changes in the actual structure of brain areas governing more constructive features like learning and memory and self-regulation. 
We set up a situation where we were looking at face-to-face -face interactions between mothers and infants, and we filmed those, and we would okay. code the baby's facial expressions and the mother's facial expressions. We wanted to understand the relationship between them. After playing a period of playing and engagement with the infant, we then signaled the mother to hold a still face, to not use her hands, to not talk, and just look straight ahead. And the effects on the infant were really uh, quite dramatic. Right away, almost every infant picks up that the mother is no longer responding. Babies have all these ways of trying to get the mother's attention. When we saw Analia today, she does the f a fake cough with her mother. They may start self-comforting by sucking on their hand. They may lose postural control, and they become increasingly withdrawn. If we can see these kinds of effects in two minutes, one can begin to think about the child who comes from a neglectful home. If that experience is not changed, if the child's experience of chronic stress does not improve, then that brain can have long-term behavioral consequences. Okay, play with her again. Okay. Hi, Amelia. Hi. Well, the good news here is that the brain's openness to experience endures for a surprisingly long time. Sometimes we talk about the brain's plasticity. And, and the term plasticity draws our attention to the continued malleability of the brain, the fact that the brain is not a finished product and will not be for many years. It means, therefore, that the brain continues to adapt to new experience. So we have learned a lot in the last 10 years. And the core team's project is using that science and applying it in effective ways in devising interventions for some of the most at-risk children in our society. And is, is that diagnosis consistent with the experience of, of the infant team yes, in working it is. with her? Yes, it is. She does present as someone who has these cognitive limitations. The most important thing that we learned and recognized was that each one of us uh, in our own profession felt isolated and frustrated of how much needed to be done and how little we could do on our own. And what the Zero to Three Court Teams project allows for judges and child welfare people now, as well as um, interventionists in mental health and other kinds of things, is an opportunity to have a relationship with somebody else who's working with these same kind of families so that one, you can work together, have a collective mind, and think about how to best serve these families, how to get the best outcomes for the young children. But a secondary gain is to have a group of colleagues who understand your work, who understand your pain, and who can help validate what you're doing. All right, well, Ms. Norris, it sounds like this family is moving toward the self-sufficiency phase and hoping for a good outcome once and for all. As a th zero to three coordinator, I think I've uh, more or less been identified as a navigator, as a go-to person for resources in the community uh, because I've had the opportunity to find the resources in the community and bringing them together. Don Bentley, who is our community coordinator, is key, in my opinion, to the success of the court team's uh, program. I work with the Child Welfare Agency and also with the attorneys. Uh, specifically, I work with the judge. And what we do is determine what special services infants and toddlers need if there is something that they need and we don't have it at the table. I'm the person to go out and try to find it. We have uh, a court team that works, the core court team that works directly with the families. Those would be the people that you see within the courtroom and family team meetings where they are helping to guide the family along. Then we have what we call a large court team, and that's our community court team, where we have the larger stakeholders who uh, work more behind the scenes. Becca and Glass, you want to talk about the uh, trauma stakeholders meeting and how it's going so far? 
We have the judges are all invited. The county attorney's office is represented, the youth law center, the public defender's office, and the parents' attorneys, the mental health treatment community. We have visiting nurse services. By bringing people together to work cooperatively for the best interests of babies, innovative ideas can emerge. One idea that is helping is the pre-removal conference. The way the juvenile court system used to function was there would probably be a removal to begin with, often with the police involved, sometimes guns drawn. I wouldn't let them in. I didn't let them in. They pounded on my door for about 45 minutes, and he was, and Isaac was sleeping, and I just laid in bed with him and held him because I knew what was coming. It was the worst feeling in the world. We decided to try a different approach. Instead of the surprise, knock, knock, we're here to take your children, thank you very much, we have now a phone call. The Department of Human Services will contact the family and say, things haven't been going so well, so we, we need to probably get the court involved, and it's very likely that you will not be able to take care of your children for a while. The first thing that we're gonna talk about is the protective concern or the reason that we're at the table today. I used about three days before um, I had destiny. Well, I think we'll go ahead and move into needs and concerns. One of the big things that I heard in the prep is they need to be able to see you, is that correct? Yeah, I okay. need to see my baby. For the parent, I think it empowers them to be part of the plan for themselves and their family and their children. It actually gives them a voice at the beginning of the process. So I think that it's really improved the relationship between the department and the families. Well, if there's nothing else for that, we'll move into family strengths. I would say that the biggest strength um, is that you were honest about your drug use and you've accepted responsibility for what happened. Another huge strength is your sister and the fact that she's willing to, to come forward and, and take custody of your kids while you work on your issues. Part of the neglect comes from lack of experience and lack of knowledge as opposed to intentionality. The dyadic or the child parent psychotherapy component is so critical in the evaluation piece and then in the treatment to understand how this child does with this caregiver. When we say dyadic therapy, we're talking about the therapist is in the room with a caregiver and child and working on that relationship and reading what's going on there. So according to the hospital reports um, that I had access to, revealed multiple rib fractures bilaterally of varying ages, which concluded that the injuries were consistent with non-accidental trauma. Mom was a high school student at the time, so she was getting up and going to school and leaving Calvin with his father, and then he was leaving them with various relatives who were sometimes leaving them with various relatives. This mom also, because I think of a variety of factors, um, had a lot of misconceptions about what was developmentally appropriate. Say bo, bo, kakor, boz. So one of the things you notice, um, or have probably picked up, that I've done along the way with you is help to put some words to what he might be feeling or what certain experiences might be like for him. So one of the things that Lisa was doing there that was wonderful is speaking for baby. That's so important, really sensitive in terms of what you're doing and building the interaction. Oh, you need you a kiss right. from mom? You need a kiss? <laughs> oh, oh, I needed a kiss. Mm -hmm. Some parents haven't learned how to be parents. Being a good parent for a lot of them would have been a lot easier if they had had good role models in being parents. We first got the call about Isaac and it was our very first situation where we would have had a foster child to possibly do reunification with the parents and so we agreed to take him into our home. We've asked them to attend the court hearing so that mom can get used to and know who the people were that were caring for her child. As they had the opportunity to have conversations with each other, they got an opportunity to find that they could develop a bond and a rapport with each other. I'm an addict. I'm a junkie. People like me don't get to be friends with people like this. And I felt pretty lucky. Melissa, to me, just seemed like she needed a friend 
older brother, mentor. We just provided a normal, stable environment and, um, and treated each other well, and everybody learned. I would come over and hang out with Isaac before I'd go to work. And um, I, as much time as I could spend with him is what I got, to, is what they, was what they gave me. Amanda and Levi are an example of what I want my life to be like. <laughs> oh, nice. And so you can't discount birth moms and dads to children. You can't do it. My name is Alana Stovall, and my husband Damien and I are foster, adoptive, and biological parents. It's time to line up. Wash your hands. It's time to eat. When a child is removed from the home, the plan for permanency is moving toward adoption and also reunification with the biological parent concurrently. So one of the best things that can happen as a result of this kind of concurrent planning is the foster parents whom I've seen who have done this the best way are so invested in the child that they're willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that that child is okay, including having an intimate relationship with the birth parent. It takes a special person to do that, but these people do exist. When a foster parent adopts a child and maintains a safe relationship with a parent, it only enriches the child's well-being. And it's critically important for that child to understand that there is value in his family of origin. I believe that it can be a new definition of family. I guess even with the removal of children, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the end of your life with your children. The goal of the court team program, one is to reduce further abuse and neglect, and the other major goal is permanency. We've worked with a lot of families, and at last count, we had 180 children that we were following, and we've had one return. One out of 180, that's unheard of in most states. The Zero to Three program believed in me. They didn't turn their back on me and my family. They were there for us, and me and my family were grateful. In the child welfare system, anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of the cases, the referral is based on the fact that there is substance abuse going on. So if there is substance abuse, then there is very likely alcohol abuse. We spend a lot of time with the child welfare talking about kids, but I think that the, the filter of FASD is often missed. The rates of exposure are so high that only a few children, a very small minority, will not have been exposed. We first got Zachariah at 10 weeks of age. Uh, we were foster parents, and we got a call from our caseworker. She said, would you please take this infant? And we said, yes, we would. Hi, Zachary. Oh, God, that's so tiny. He was medically fragile, failure to thrive. His biological mother was always drinking. She admitted to us of drinking three to four gallons of vodka per week all through pregnancy. The caseworkers did not believe that Zachariah would even live through the night. When women drink during pregnancy, alcohol goes into their stomach, into their bloodstream, uh, and then into the fetus. And in the fetus, it causes a range of problems. The most severe problems typically are those with a developing brain. Alcohol is the only substance that is identified as a teratogen. And that is a substance that when ingested during pregnancy will cause a birth defect. Um, crack, uh, methamphetamine, heroin, these things are not good for a pregnancy, but alcohol is the only one that causes literally structural changes in the brain development. This is the number one cause 
of mental retardation, intellectual disability in the United States, very likely worldwide. It's a preventable disorder. I think it's helpful for people to understand this spectrum of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. First, a small number of children have fetal alcohol syndrome. These are children who are short, skinny, some abnormal facial features. When Zachariah was an infant and you looked at him, you could tell that something was desperately wrong with the child. His face was smooshed. It's flat here, flat across the forehead, very dominant one side or the other. The left side he could not use. There were outward physical signs. The overwhelming majority of people who are affected by drinking during pregnancy don't have those problems. Maybe 75, 80 percent of affected people uh, have alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorders. They have a lot of the brain damage without having the growth deficiency, without having the facial features. And if you've ever seen an iceberg representation of fetal alcohol syndrome, the majority of the problem is underwater. Uh, it's harder for them to be recognized they're less likely to get services, and that actually increases their risk for adverse outcomes over time. The brain damage is kind of um, there their whole lives, but it looks different depending how old they are. With a fetal alcohol affected infant, they don't have good cell arousal regulation, which means they startle easy. Somebody slams a door and they'll scream, whereas most babies just get used to it. He could not modulate from one mood to another. He would get too high up and, and screaming or crying or whatever and too far down, and he could not bring him back so, himself back to center. They have really significant feeding issues, so they tend to uh, spit up a lot, have trouble gaining weight. <laughs> This all makes for very cranky babies, and cranky babies and sleep-deprived parents um, don't go together very well, and so they, they may be um, abused or neglected, shaken baby, that kind of stuff may be common. Abuse and neglect increase your risk for foster care. Going into foster care increases your risk for more behavior problems, which is an, increases your risk for more difficulty returning back to your parents. And so this is a spiraling chain unless we figure out a way to uh, get this stopped. Early diagnosis, early intervention are keys to this. So we have enough evidence to suggest that there are effects of exposure. Uh, we're really as interested in whether or not the child has needs that we can make recommendations about. What's happened in the past is that people have said permanent brain damage and then they've said, well, we can't do anything. Uh, and that is not the case. And we do really see very positive outcomes in children who do get good early intervention. We had a team here at the Marcus Institute that made a critical diagnosis for him uh, with all the paperwork and bells and whistles that go with it um, and told us what therapists, um, what types of therapy we would need and pointed us in the direction of some. We like to think of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder intervention as beginning with parent education so that people understand this disorder. We try to teach them about specific intervention strategies. Everything becomes therapy. We used um, occupational therapy in the water, which is called aqua therapy, and that made a difference, a big difference for him because of the water pressure against his whole body. Um, gave him a sense of comfort. When he wasn't in the water, as an infant, he had to be swaddled. Jumping was very good for him. We had a bouncy seat that would hang from, that would hang from the doorpost, and he would get in that, and if he was over agitated and crying, we'd start him to bounce, and that bouncing really would calm him, and in a few minutes later, he'd be just grinning from ear to ear. So early intervention with these kids is our only hope. The brain is very plastic at that age. And I guess the story that I like to tell is if a 55-year-old has a stroke, we don't say to the 55-year-old, gee, I'm really sorry you had a stroke, good luck. 
you know, and his brain is past plasticity in a lot of ways, that what we consider major. But with OT, with PT, with speech therapy, stroke victims do recover a lot of function. If we can do that with a 55-year-old brain, what can we do with a brain zero to three that has huge amounts of ability to choose different pathways, to develop more pathways? When he was a toddler, we participated in a study which taught him strategies in math. Math is one of those skills that they said, no, he probably would never be good at. He is now in sixth grade, and he is in advanced mathematics. How long have you been working on that, Zachariah? All day today. We have very good outcome data about the effects of early detection, early diagnosis, and early intervention into services. But this is a lifelong condition. Uh, it doesn't go away. Many of these children will develop behavior problems and problems with um, impulse control and self-regulation as they get older. I don't want to paint too rosy of a picture for children with FASD. He knows he has to deal with his impulsivity. He knows he has to work with cause and effect and with retaining um, consequence for his actions. Is it something that I worry about? Yes, it is. I do worry about him. I am very concerned for him. It's important to recall that prenatal alcohol exposure is like a magnet and it attracts other adversities. Mental health problems are considered to be a secondary disability for people with FASD. Other secondary disabilities are interruptions in their education. They get expelled, they get suspended on a regular basis, and at some point they just give up and they stop going. They also then, you know, I always say, if kids are not in school, then what are they doing? Well, they're getting into trouble. And then that results in them having trouble with the law. And they are more than likely at over 80% to be unemployed. So those are all secondary disabilities related to having an FASD. So it's important that the judges involved with this uh, realize they could begin early screening which would lead to early diagnosis earlier intervention detail. into treatment all right so I'm ready as to the mother another reason uh, for them to understand about this is to help the mother of the child coming in to a custody type situation with her problems and is is that diagnosis consistent with the experience of, of the infantine Yes, it is. Yes, it is. She does present as someone who has these cognitive limitations. A mother who has herself uh, FASD, which is not uncommon, may not have been recognized, and it, usually if she's coming into the child welfare system or into the uh, dependency courts, it's very likely that uh, people have not identified her problem and treated it effectively. Uh, such a woman may uh, have significant problems with addiction, she may have few family resources, she may, may have educational deficiencies, all of which are going to affect her ability to parent. I really believe that one of the reasons that we are not able to do more reunification is that the child welfare system doesn't understand why their parents are failing. And one of the reasons their parents are failing is that they have organic brain damage and we're not taking that into account when we work with them. They're going to have, for the most part, really poor memory. Um, especially verbal memory. Please don't tell them to do something just by telling them. They will not remember it. As my mother used to say, it will go in one ear and out the other. They're really bad at time. So, you know, saying to them, be there in 10 minutes. A lot of us have an internal clock of what 10 minutes looks like. They don't have that. So they are constantly late for appointments, missing appointments, and that gets them in trouble with their probation officer. That means they didn't show up for their child visitation when they were supposed to. So there are a lot of adverse consequences for that particular brain impairment. And so when we're dealing uh, with people who have limited reading skills, limited oral comprehension understanding skills, uh, it's not going to uh, be much help if we spend 30 minutes discussing 40 recommendations with them. They're only going to be able to retain two or three of these. There is just simply too much information coming at people. We do have the responsibility to change the way we work rather than expecting them to fit into our little world. And it doesn't have to be complicated and it certainly doesn't have to be expensive. 
What are you all going to do to change what you normally do to address this family? And I'm talking about changing what you do, both you and the department, what you do to fit her. I want the plan today. I would love for her to go into Liberty House where there is that support. They will take her grocery shopping. They will budget, teach her how to budget. They will teach her how to cook meals. They will provide her with safe and stable housing. So we've got some choices. Uh, we can find them a uh, cognitive partner, somebody to go along, listen, explain this. And very importantly, we can make provisions for them uh, to help with things like scheduling, uh, planning. Has mom been paying her $25 um, uh, parental support? No, she hasn't. She has to get a money order herself. She's never gotten a money Have order. Have you walked her through it? Take her around on Canal Street mm -hmm. and... To go get a money order. Show her how if to get a money order. And, show her, and then to give her an envelope and take her to the post office and show her how to send it to Baton Rouge. Yeah, you're going to have to write all that down. I know. Take I know. It I anyway. Know. You're going to have to write all that down for her. Just, to, just walk her through it and show her how to do it. And so instead of complaining about moms not showing up for interventions, uh, we can call them ahead of time. Or if it's a really important meeting, go over there and get them. There's a cycle that they were born into. That includes poverty, that includes substance abuse, that includes abuse. So it's very important that if we're going to break the cycle, we need to intervene with the parents to help them stop drinking. Fetal alcohol uh, spectrum disorder is tremendously expensive for our society. The lifetime cost of care for an affected person is about two and a half million dollars. One percent of the population are affected. So we're spending billions every year treating a preventable problem. We have a dramatic opportunity to prevent another affected child. One of the unique opportunities in public health presents itself right there. I anticipate that today we're going to have people use fewer services, do much better as adolescents and adults, uh, more likely to be employed, more likely to live at uh, greater levels of independence. Because it's in the last 10 years we've been able to do research on uh, the effects of intervention with alcohol affected kids and we've just been so happy to see the positive results. The doctors wanted him institutionalized. Zachariah now is 12 years old. He wants to be a Major League Baseball player. Do I think he can do it? Oh yeah, big time, he can do it. He is one of the best pitchers in his age bracket. With early intervention, he is a success story now. Bringing a baby into the court system is often horribly traumatic to the family and especially to the infant who has already experienced abuse and neglect. One idea that is helping is the pre-removal conference. It enlists parents in protecting their children, making them part of the solution. 
When I started this work about 16 years ago, the parents came into court with their sleeves rolled up, not ready to work, but ready to defend themselves. They were scared, they were distrustful, they were angry, they had all the emotions that anyone would have when thrown into this system. Their children have been removed from their care, often with the police involved, sometimes guns drawn. Removals truly would re-traumatize children and parents because there would be something, whether it be drug use, domestic violence, you know, an injury to a serious injury to a child that was requiring um, the removal to occur. And then often the child would be re-traumatized by um, a police officer and a social worker coming to the home and you know, taking them. And so as you're removing them from the home, no matter what the situation or how bad the situation is in the home, they love their parents and that's where they want to be and so they're scared. When I first lost my child, um, the police came to my house and I didn't know what was going on. And I wanted to get sober, but I was so, um, so far into my addiction, I, I couldn't stay sober one day. I think most people don't say, when I have this child, I'm going to be a substance abuser. When I have this child, I'm going to get in a domestically abusive relationship. Or I'm going to traumatize this child as they're growing up. Everybody really wants the same thing for their children, but, but depending on what's going on, p parents have different capacities. And really what we're trying to do is, is immediately protect the children and then give the parents the help that they need so that they can be a better parent for their children. We decided to try a different approach. Instead of the surprise, Knock, knock, we're here to take your children, thank you very much. The Department of Human Services will contact the family and say, things haven't been going so well. We need to probably get the court involved and you will not be able to take care of your children for a while. A pre-removal conference is, is a meeting between the family and the Department of Human Services to discuss the removal of the children. And really what the process is, is we have a family come in at 1.30 and they sit down with the facilitator to talk about what's going to happen so that they know and it's kind of the prep time so we can explain to them what's going to happen that day. Well, I understand that today is a very difficult day for your family and I want to thank you very much for coming in. What we're going to do is we are going to come up with a plan to help get the kids back with you, Khalees, okay? All right, do you have any questions before I bring everyone else in? No, I just want to know when I'm going to see my baby. Okay, and that's definitely something that we'll talk about. So I will grab the other individuals and we'll get started, okay? The other thing that occurs is the parent partner is introduced to the family and the parent partner program is introduced so that they understand kind of, you know, what's going on and what a parent partner is and what a parent partner is going to do during a pre-removal conference. My name is Bobby and I'm invited to the table as a support for you. I'm a parent that has also had my children removed so I know exactly how you feel today. But what I can do is I can take some notes so that you can just kind of, um, be present in this meeting, and then if there's things that you want to talk about afterwards, we can talk about it, okay? All right. The family may choose not to have a parent partner, but even if it's just somebody sitting there during a meeting telling them you're going to get through this meeting, it's going to be okay because it's so, it, again, it's so chaotic. So then we walk into the pre-removal conference at 2 o'clock, the whole family's there, DHS is there, and we have our ongoing worker who has just been assigned, who's now just for the first time meeting the family, and we have our assessment worker who actually does the child abuse assessments, the one that's going to be requesting the removal, saying the children are at imminent risk. They all sit down and they do the meeting. One of the first things that we cover is, you know, why are we there? You know, and we really try to encourage the parent to talk about you know, what's going on in their life that's resulting in the removal of the children. We really think it's important for the parent to have their voice in that. The first thing that we're going to talk about is the protective concern or the reason that we're at the table today. I used about three days before um, I had destiny. Okay, thank you. I know that that was very hard for you to share. So even they're about as low as they can get as far as having their children removed, we really do try to start out with strengths. You know, what are the strengths with the family that we can build from? I would say that the biggest strength um, is that you were honest about your drug use and you've accepted responsibility for what happened. Another huge strength is your sister and the fact that she's willing to, to come forward and, and take custody of your kids while you work on your issues. You know, when you look at all the research, children do better with relatives. They do better with family. Um, children are, are best served if they can remain in the parents' home and remain there safe, but if that can't happen, they're much better if we can put them with somebody that they know. Um, really, the last resort really should be foster care. And if you go f far enough and wide enough, you can usually find healthy family members that can take children that want to protect children that will do the right thing. So then we start out with strengths, and then we kind of go into needs, and then we also have visiting nurse services that attend the meetings uh, for the health care needs of the children. 
Is there anything else? Do they have any appointments coming up? Well, because um, Destiny tested positive, we would like to have her evaluated at the Regional Child Protection Center. And that's a, a team that works with children that have been exposed to drugs and know the effects of drugs on children and, and are um, able to assess their needs. Denise, do you have supplies to have the baby at your home? Like, do you have a crib or car seat, those sorts of things? I talked to the social worker at the hospital and I think they have a car seat for Destiny. Um, a crib. And, and what about today, like diapers and formula? Well, the, the hospital already has some that they're going to send home. You'll be able to get WIC, though, which is the Women, Infants, and Children's Program, and you can get signed up. Um, that will provide formula and then also some um, dietary foods for, for Michael. Well, now we have a plan. They have things that, that mean something to them. Hopefully they're being placed with a family member, and there's a plan for them to have the family interaction. What will the family interaction look like? What we've talked about is obviously we want Khalees having as much contact with the kids as she possibly can, um, supervised. So when I'm there, Denise has to be there. Denise and your mom will supervise a lot of your contact with the kids so that we can get you as much of that contact as possible, but Katie will still be doing some. And I will meet with you weekly to evaluate safety in the home um, and make sure that whenever we return the kids to your care that everything is safe for the children. Is there any crisis planning that we need to do regarding family interactions? Um, any reason that a visit might need to be ended? Denise, obviously, if you believe that she's under the influence, then that, that visit needs to end. Um, I need you to call me or subsequently Jessica once the case transfers. If David is released from jail and he goes over to Denise's house, what would be the plan at that point? You need to call me. You need to tell him that he's that that's what he needs to do is that he needs to contact us and that you're not able to authorize any type of contact with the kids or anything like that, that that needs to all come through the department. Um, well, moving on, Khalees, during the prep I heard you say that you don't really know what's going on and you kind of want to know what you need to do to move forward. Is that correct? Um, so I'm going to turn that over to either Janelle or Jessica. Kind of talk to me about what some expectations might be for Khalees at this point. There's another service for Khalees that we didn't talk about was her actually attending some groups maybe at Children and Families of Iowa okay. to address the domestic violence that's occurred between she and David. Children and Families of Iowa has a lot of services, Khalees. There are just educational groups about noticing um, signs of abusers and, and how to exit those relationships, and there are also individual therapists there that can work with you. Khalees, I'll also be asking that you provide random drug screens. I'll send you out a letter with a phone number that you'll call every day. If your assigned number is called that day, then you'll need to go in and provide your drug screen. Is that something that you're willing to do? Yeah. Yes? Okay. As long as I can stay sober today. Okay. So that's something that we need to talk about. Um, I'm going to actually give Khalees my phone number. Um, I'd be willing to go to meetings with you. I do attend alcohol well, meetings. Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, I can be that that person for you to, um, you know, kind of talk you off the ledge if you feel like you want to go use. Then after the, the prayer removal conference, what we do is then we sit down with the family members that are taking the children and we start signing them up for their benefits. And then depending on the age of the children, you know, you still, then you have zero to three, you have other programs that get, get involved to help us with the services to make sure um, that, that we're getting the families where they need to be. We also have Judy Norris with us here today and she's with the Zero to Three program. I'm here talking to you today because uh, you have a child that's under the age of three and that uh, affords you an opportunity to participate in what's called the Zero to Three court in Judge Cohen's courtroom. One of the things is, is that we'll make sure that there is a really good bond and attachment between you and your kids. Do you think I'm not bonded with my kids? No, I absolutely think that you have a great love for your kids. Am I wrong on that? No. But sometimes when parents have a substance abuse problems or there's domestic violence that occurs um, in the home, that affects your kids. And you probably know that, don't you? Yeah. So what we want to do as a team of professionals, we want to help walk you through maybe undoing some of that harm that has happened in the past. I just feel overwhelmed. It is very overwhelming. Hang in there. When we first started implementing prayer removal conferences, the concept came up. Um, I think pe most people thought it was a good idea and concept, but they were really worried about how it would play out. And what I can tell you is we've done literally hundreds of these pre-removal conferences, and I think almost every family has shown up. We maybe have had one that didn't show up. 
Uh, we've never had a physical altercation at a pre-removal conferences. Families come to the meetings and willing to participate. For the parent, I think it empowers them to be part of the plan for themselves and their family and their children. It actually gives them a voice at the beginning of the process. So I think that it's really improved the relationship between the department and the families. We started this in um, October of 2006, and by January of 2007, the community and my staff were demanding that we do it in all cases they saw it as being that powerful. When your staff are coming to you and saying, I felt like a social worker again, I felt helpful, that means a lot because I think it really shows that, that you can be innovative in the child welfare system and you can engage with families in a different way. One of the parents had made a comment to whoever was part of the pre-removal conference and saying, does the Department of Human Services know that you're doing this? You know, that, that maybe there was some secret that people were in on that DHS didn't know about because they were being so family friendly and so family focused and, and it was just such a different experience and more positive than what they had experienced in the past. I wouldn't let him in. I didn't let him in. They pounded on my door for about 45 minutes. And he was, and Isaac was sleeping, and I just laid in bed with him and held him because I knew what was coming. Exhibits one through and including five are admitted. There is a plethora of difficult challenges facing parents today. Poverty, lack of housing, unstable housing, mental illness, they have been victimized themselves. They've lived a life in which they have been neglected or abused. They are addicted to drugs. I grew up in domestic violence and my mom was alcoholic and um, I just hated myself. And I wanted to get sober, but I was so, um, so far into my addiction, I, I couldn't stay sober one day. They often turn to substances to numb out the pain that they experience on a day-to-day -day basis because they've grown up without love and without care. And they have very painful lives. My mother didn't raise me. My mother wasn't in my life. My grandmother did. And I always felt different when I was a child. Always, always, always felt different. If our goal in child welfare is really to help these parents to become better parents, we have to deal with their early experiences of trauma. I had an uncle that was very uh, inappropriate with me. Nobody believed me. My grandma didn't believe that her son was doing this to me. So that kind of, I think that kind of did a number on my self-worth and what was wrong with me. We do see a fair amount of um, parents who have been sexually abused, but we also think that probably there may be more of it out there and they don't talk about it. When I was young, my parents, um, they fought a lot when they drank. They split up several times, they separated several times. Uh, we lived with an aunt for a while and um, things happened. Um, I was molested by a relative um, several times while I was growing up and um, didn't ever deal with that kind of stuff. I was introduced to um, crack and um, that seemed to take away every little thing that I was trying to deal with. 
I think some people would just write them off and say this is just a drug addict and they're having kids and why do you waste your time and forget about it and this is going to be a crack baby. And that's not the reality. This parent may decide to get sober for the first time in 10 years because somebody cares enough to listen. Hey, you watch your little brother, okay? Calvin, keep an eye on him, okay? Edwin's case on paper wasn't a pretty <laughs> sight to see. If you were to look at his case on paper, you would think that there's no way that this man can safely parent his child. I pretty much grew up on the streets, so I was a part of the, the drugs and the gangs, and any time I got frustrated, I would turn to drugs, you know, to relieve some of that frustration. What we found in him, though, is that when he was surrounded by people that believed in him, he was so cooperative and so willing to hear and to learn and to ask questions and to really want to know what the best thing is for his child. When she puts her weight on the elbows, mm -hmm. that helps build up these shoulder muscles, so that's very important. You yeah, know, she wants putting... to roll over right now. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I knew that I was always a good dad, but I just didn't have the time and the patience to really understand what being a dad was all about because of running the streets. Because she's going to need her immunizations, okay? And so a lot of it is teaching people how to break that cycle of the way they were parented so that they can do better and to help them understand it's not their fault and that they can make changes and be a better parent than they have the benefit of having. Other people would have had a lot of judgments or a lot of thoughts about um, what a mom like this um, brings to the table. Um, she's a young mom. She has been in a violent relationship. Um, she is now, as a result of that, a single parent, um, doing it on her own, struggling to finish high school and, and take care of this baby. Look, Cork. <laughs> Look, say sailboat. Say boat. I really worked on addressing with her the things that she was doing well and really tried to bring up the things um, that were maybe falling a little bit more behind or the things she was struggling with so that she was in a better position to succeed as a parent. You need a kiss from mom? You need a kiss? Oh, I needed a kiss. So one of the things you notice, um, or I've probably picked up, that I've done along the way with you is help to put some words to what he might be feeling or what certain experiences might be like for him. A parents can, can learn many different ways. Uh, the best way is to see somebody else do it. Okay. So the parents supporting other parents. He's got that comb over going on, that uh -huh. comb over going on. Fine. Melissa, to me, just seemed like she needed a friend older brother, mentor. We just provided a normal, stable environment and, um, and treated each other well, and everybody learned. I would come over and hang out with Isaac before I'd go to work. And um, I, as much time as I could spend with him is what I got, to, is what they, was what they gave me. Amanda and Levi are an example of what I want my life to be like. Oh, nice. These parents believe that they have been provided the dignity, the respect, the opportunity, and when they cannot manage to get themselves situated and ready to reunify and provide for their children, they know that it's best for their children to be raised by someone else. I drew the circles to the problem, um, and then I wrote the answers down and I counted all of them. We've adopted three children from foster care, and it was very important for me to maintain a level of relationship with their mother. The things that are going on now within foster care are opening up everyone's eyes to the possibility of taking away the secrecy, removing the, the shroud of shame from the biological parent. I think when you get a handle on the fact that everyone needs help from time to time in their um, parenting journeys, then that will benefit everyone, especially the children. We are trying to identify each individual family's unique needs and offer them 
every opportunity to be successful. Judge Cohen always treated me with respect and she, she applauded me and it encouraged me. I'm always optimistic. Isaac and I are gonna be fine. The Zero to Three program believed in me. They didn't turn their back on me and my family. And we wasn't looked at as, you know, someone that's been in trouble or a drug addict. We was looked at as parents. It was a beautiful feeling.